Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for being here. It's such an honor. I don't know how everybody found this, but I'm super pumped. <laughs> um, so yeah, and also everybody on Zoom as well. Thank you. Um, so why are we having this talk series? So this is the Regenerative Landscaping Speaker Series. And it really started with the fact that my husband, Ben, and I now live at Tamron, which is about 15 miles north of Durango. And I realized they are still spraying chemicals and have for a long time, um, as well as synthetic fertilizers. So I was like, you know, I, I put this kind of focus on Tamron just because I live there and I would love to be somewhere where I'm not worried about cancer or when I take our cat out for a walk, she loves to go for walks on a leash. Um, and I don't want her walking around in grass or eating grass that has these chemicals. So I was trying to think, well, what can we do to motivate people and kind of encourage to go in this direction of actual healthy landscaping? So, and I, I want to point out, I don't, I'm not trying to put like a negative spin for Tamron or anything. A lot of large land holding entities spray chemicals in universities, colleges, businesses, tons of HOAs. And Tamron, I think, is the largest HOA in our area. And so it'd be a huge thing if we could get that to ship. I think it's like 23 acres. Um, so why do we spray? And I thought I would just go over that just a little bit as kind of a primer for kind of where we're heading with the next, like this series goes through September, if you didn't know. So we've got to talk each month through September. And uh, I feel like there's about three reasons why people continue to spray. Uh, one is they, they don't know what else to do. It's what we've always done. But honestly, it's only been since World War II that we've done this. We turned wartime chemicals into peacetime food production. And, and it's like, okay, well, it's been about 75 years or so. So it feels like we've always done this. It's definitely not. So I feel like that's one big reason. Um, also, I feel like people don't truly understand how toxic and damaging these chemicals are, not just for the landscape, but also for people and pets and wildlife and for the water cycle and soil health and all these things. So they don't really, you know, they think, oh, it's for sale, like at Home Depot or whatever. It can't be that toxic, but it is. Um, and then they don't know what to expect if they stop. It's kind of like, that angst of, oh my gosh, if we stop spraying, there might be a weed. Oh. However, we know with the spraying of these chemicals, it's not like weeds go away. And what is a weed anyway? It's really just a word we put you know, on a plant for something we don't know where it is. Um, and I like to point out that dandelions are like, seem to be the nemesis of every, every uh, land manager. And they're the first food for babies out of winter. And here we are spraying them and wondering why there's colony collapse disorder and these kinds of things. So. Um, so what are we actually doing when we spray? So I wanted to give kind of like a visceral image for everyone of, of kind of connecting this to how we are in community and how plants are in community. So it would be literally like killing our entire community around us, you're just by yourself, and putting yourself on a drug drip, right? So that's what we're doing to the plants. We're killing their entire soil microbiome community tons of life happening in there. So 95% of life on land on this planet resides in the soil. So 5%, like all of us, the trees, the plants, all the biomass, that above the ground is only 5%. 95% is in the soil. And teaspoon of healthy soil, you have more microorganisms in that healthy soil than there are people on the planet in just one teaspoon. And we're killing all of that when we spray these chemicals. And then we put synthetic fertilizer, so NPK, Yes, plants can survive on NPK, but they need more than that. So it's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So I just kind of wanted to give that sense of, of course, like these plants are kind of just used to now, you know, this, this drug drip of NPK, and they don't have their community to support them. So what's going to happen if we stop spraying? So soil is like the microbiome of the planet, just like our microbiome in our guts. And people are starting to learn more about that the past 15 to 20 years. Um, we're starting to realize how much our health depends on our own microbiome. We are more bacterial cells than we are human cells. It's crazy. Here we are thinking we're humans. What? Um, so, and it's the same with the soil. It's when we have healthy soil, we can have a healthy planet because everything is connected. It also contributes to nutrient density of food and all of those amazing things, which contributes to our health. So, um, when we have these toxic chemical sprays for killing the, the soil life, um, and then we have those synthetic fertilizers that are kind of acting as that drug drip. So what do we do and what do we expect if we stop this? So the land has to heal. It's going to go through a transition. It's basically like you're taking off this, this NPK fertilizer thing. You're not spraying the surrounding soil anymore. And so everything kind of has to 
regain relationship and all these connections within the soil. You've got mycorrhizal fungi, you've got earthworms and dung beetles and all the microorganisms, everything interacting together. And it's this beautiful symbiotic relationship and they're transferring things in the soil too. I mean, there's nitrogen fixing bacteria that take nitrogen from the atmosphere and put it into a form that plants can utilize. And yet we've taken away that connection. So that's what has to reconnect. Um, and then plants have to learn how to plant again. They're like, oh, hey guys, forgot that I had this community. <laughs> and so they're all, you know, getting used to each other again and starting to figure out those, those connection points and those relationships. So, you know, if you think about our microbiome, like if we took antibiotics, if you need to take antibiotics because you're sick, you're killing everything in your gut, it's a good idea to take probiotics so we can kind of re-inoculate our system with good, good bacteria, right? Same with the soil. We can do that with things like compost heat. So it's not just let's take away all of the sprays and the synthetic fertilizers and just leave it like that. We have to support it with life again. We can do compost teas, we can have animal impact, we can have all kinds of amazing things that bring back that soil life and those connections. Um, and the planet evolved crazy diversity. We don't even know what this planet is capable of because we have taken away so much diversity of life. And so as we start to reconnect with life, when we start to see these, these interactions happen again, it's, it's going to be insane, but we have to allow that transition to happen and not be scared of what that's going to look like. Um, so I'm really looking at more of like a regenerative collective mindset. So if we think about, you know, how have we gotten the planet to this point where we're losing, what is it, like 200 species a day or something ridiculous? I mean, it's crazy what's happening, the crazy intense storms, the droughts, the wildfires, the floods. How do we reconnect all of this? And what, what has done that? So all of these things that we're using, whether it's chemicals or um, technology, these are all tools. They cannot be bad or good on their own. So what, what makes them bad or good? Anybody have an idea? Mm -hmm. Right here, it's our mindset. So we're thinking in this industrial mechanical way, like the planet and our bodies are machines, but they are not. So there are these complex biological living systems that reorganize themselves and form these new relationships. So as we start to unlearn this industrial mechanical mindset, we start to relearn, reconnect what is truly intrinsic to who we are, and we realize that relationships are the basis for regeneration, that's, that's literally all it is, whether it's relationships within the soil or relationships within nature or people with nature or with each other. As those relationships start to reform, we actually regain health, biodiversity, and we thrive. So that's where I want to leave that. Um, so you might have seen online, so projectdungbeetle.org, you can find a petition on there under the Regenerative Landscaping Speaker Series. If you haven't signed that, please do. Again, petition sounds like a negative word, and I'm not trying to be negative. Um, but change.org has been a great platform to get this out there and get people to sign it. So please share that and sign it. <clears throat> I know currently, from what I know, Tamron is planning to spray this spring. Last year, it was the end of May. Um, oof, man, I remember walking down the sidewalk and it's just hitting me. It's so thick and it smells awful. Um, so I would love to get that canceled and start to reintroduce life to the land and we can start to get these healthy relationships back because we have to stop at some point, right? Um, and then I want to point out sponsors. So James Ranch Grill, amazing, amazing. I'm sure pretty much everybody in here is eating there. Raise your hand. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> um, so everything there is local, regenerative. They source amazingly. So not only is the food not toxic, but it's actually nutrient dense. You're getting tons of healthy nutrient dense food. And it's from our local farmers and ranchers. So look at those relationships that we're creating when you're eating that food. It's just amazing. Um, we have WeFill. Who's shopped at WeFill up on North Main? Yes, awesome. WeFill is awesome. She's trying to get away from plastic. She's trying to source local as much as possible. It's refilling our containers so we're not doing more of the spurge of plastic. Um, we have Gleason Bison. Who's heard of Gleason Bison? Yes, awesome. And we do have but we do have some stuff in the back as well. I know there's some um, postcards back there with Lisa Bison. So she uh, ranches bison regeneratively with holistic plant and grazing on 900 acres of Asperus. So she actually moves bison the way nature intended them to be moved. So she is utilizing electric fencing to move them the way predators would move them. And in that way, it regenerates land like crazy because the land co-evolved with ruminants and that predator pressure. So that's awesome. Um, and then Durango Outdoor Exchange, 
these pants are from there. Um, it, actually, the thing I'm wearing is used, but these pants are from for Dre Gotter Exchange. Awesome. I love going there for all that awesome stuff. And then I have all my amazing speakers here. Um, and this, like I said, just check out the, the website, projectdunneagle.org, and you'll see the uh, flyer for where all these talks are going to be. A few of them are at Jane Branch, one more is here at the library. So, anyway, I think that does it. I want to introduce Katrina Blair. I have a bio to read about her. Um, so, she is Turtle Lake Refuge in Eat Happy Lands. So, Katrina Blair began studying wild plants in her teens when she camped out alone for a summer with the intention of eating primarily wild foods. She later wrote The Wild Edible and Medicinal Plants of the San Juan Mountains for her senior project at Colorado College. In 1997, she completed an MA at John F. Kennedy University in Orinda, California in holistic health education. She founded Turtle Lake Refuge in 1998, a nonprofit whose mission is to celebrate the connection between personal health and wild lands. She is the author of the books, Local Wildlife, Turtle Lake Refuge's Re Recipes for Living Deep, a book that focuses on the uses and recipes of the local wild abundance, and Wild Wisdom of Weeds, 13 Essential Plants for Human Survival. So welcome, Katrina. Thank you so much. I wanted to just thank Mandy so much for your passion and vision. You're on fire in the best way. And what she's speaking about in her actions are needed so much more than ever now. And all of us who are here, I also know many of you resonate we resonate on the same level of how can we help and that mindfulness of how do we take those steps of action to make change that really support quality of life. But I just really rec um, commend you for your work. Thank I'm you. grateful to be collaborating with you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm very honored to be here as part of this speaking series. And we're going to give a give you a little, um, I wonder, uh, if it's hmm, very curious, it looks like it's a little cut off, but maybe they aren't all cut off. There is not a cut off. That's okay. Well, that, I'll read it to you if it is. So today's focus is going to be about our project called Be Happy Lands, and it's a project of Turtle Lake Refuge, and it's a way where we really our land whispers in a sense of really listening to the land and how can we be a positive source a positive influence to like this <laughs> um, how can we be a positive influence to really supporting the next level of fertility and stability and diversity on the land and really growing more abundance for life on earth you know it's not just for the humans but we're an essential cog in the wheel, and we can be a real positive uh, influence, you know. And so it's listening and being guided by all the other beings of life. How can we help be part of the great symphony of life? So it's a uh, before I go deep into Be Happy Lands, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what Turtle Lake Refuge is. So, yeah, we started um, as a Nonprofit officially in 2000, but I was on a bicycle serving lunches in 98 <laughs> at the Smiley Building. And so we officially begin then. But our mission is to celebrate the connection between personal health and wild lands. And there's something about that that just the wild lands part is that's sort of our truest teacher. That's where we get our inspiration and our information. And so the closer we can be to that source, the more we can show up in a way that's probably harmonizing with all of it. And so that's why really sharing and promoting the wild food abundance around us. Because when we go outside and you pick a fresh choke cherry or eat a fresh dandelion leaf, something that planted itself, that has this intelligence of this ecosystem of this place, that intelligence goes right into humanity, into us, this community. And then we become better stewards of the land because we're listening closer. And of course, you know, all abundance locally is fabulous. But then there's this next level of that wild intelligence that I just appreciate. And the weeds, you know, which are so vital, they live on every continent on the planet, except for maybe Antarctica, which is mm -hmm. mostly ice. But, <laughs> but everywhere there's humans living permanently, there's these wild plants. And they are really attuned to change and 
um, you know, not so like di like disturbed soils and um, dealing with all kinds of cold and hot and warm and wet and dry. They can deal with this divert like adversity in a way. And so when we eat them, it helps us be more resilient to the kinds of changes that we're experiencing. So, and like Mandy was saying, unfortunately, those are the plants that are targeted for these terrible practices of herbicides. And that's like absolutely going in the wrong direction because everything we do is for life. Like we're listening to life vitality and then the steps we take are going in that direction. So when we go in a direction that's counter life, Mycocides, herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, it's it's never worth the short-term effect because it ends up, it's like we have to start over. And sometimes we don't even have as much resources to go back to even the good kind of launching ground. So Turtle Lake, in case you don't know, is um, a little wild food cafe and we serve lunches on Tuesdays and Fridays from 11.11 to 2.22. <laughs> and it's a four course delicious meal with a soup, salad, main entree and dessert and juice. And it's always different. It's like an art piece and we use the local foods and it's a great place to connect, you know, with other like-minded people. We often have, you know, community tables. So it's a great place to just have conversation and get inspired. And we grow microgreens for different restaurants and towns and schools and for, um, People who would want to come and get, you know, it's fun because we grow year round. So it's a nice place to get your greens or make your green juice even in the winter when there's not much growing outside. And we also do a lot of education, taking people out on wild foraging walks and making yummy food. Like, what do you do with all these wild things and how do you make it delicious? And so that's part of our education. And we love working with kids, and kids are already listening close you know, to the earth and to the flowers and the bees and the worms. They're already excited at that level with their full attention. And so they're easy sell. <laughs> so we love to get, bring out the bicycle blender and, um, you know, go harvest some wild things and put it in and make a green smoothie or whatever we're up to. But part of it is, you know, as permaculturists, um, one of the big foundations of permaculture is you take something that you might see as a problem and you turn it into a resource. Like, and the only way we can do that is take off the old lens because we can't see the solution in the same eyes as the problem. So you change, you change your sunglasses <laughs> and then all of a sudden you realize, whoa, there's all these abundant weeds everywhere. That's, that's like a gold mine because the weeds have more nutrition, more bioavailability. They're, you know, these deep perennial taproots often. So they've got these relationships with the mycelium and the underground microorganisms, and they're drawing up minerals from the earth. All these trace minerals that we can't get from annual crops or definitely from commercially grown foods. And so these plants have this brilliance. And if we see them as the gold mine that they truly are, and then we integrate them, how do we get them into the human? Well, put chocolate with it in there. <laughs> that works every time. But also, yeah, whatever, however we can make it exciting. So we do um, start to benefit from this wild food in our community. And we love to feed our community wild food, you know, at the farmer's market, really every chance we get. And part of it is because the more we all, like, I like to think of us as a beehive also. And we're, we're really one being, we're, you know, we're all individual cells in this one being. As a community, we really act that way because everything we do affects everyone else. So the wiser we are together, the better we're gonna make good decisions for our home. And the more wild foods we eat as a community makes us that much more <laughs> close to our instincts and intelligence in that deeper way. So that's part of our methods. So in addition to our cafe, we have a farm that's about seven miles that way, right by Turtle, past Turtle Lake a little bit. And we have four acres of land and we have several greenhouses and there are lots of abundance in there. We have honeybees, which is such a valuable, I mean, just is so special to have them as part of our family. <laughs> this is one of those, um, yeah, so, so precious. 
So we we obviously really care that we don't want spray happening nearby, both herbicides or mosquito spray, insecticides, because it will absolutely kill the bees. I mean, some. Sometimes it's immediate, sometimes it's just that slow accumulation of being exposed and then they bring it home to the hive. And, it, and so that's a real important priority. But ironically, <laughs> for the last 20 years, I'm right on the other side of that fence. So our organic garden, two acres at this time, um, was, was what we were working with. But right on the other side of that fence is that building. And that building was the Scott's uh, chem lawn operation. And they sprayed all of Durango, all the city parks, all the county roads, and they stored 10 different herbicides from 240 to glyphosate to ameliopilates to dicamba, all these different herbicides. In, uh, and that's the fence that we share. That's the building that they're stored in 10 feet from our organic gardens. And it's to the ceiling tanks. We're talking hundreds of thousands of gallons and semi trucks would come on down our little dirt road and bring out the hose and fill up their tanks. And then at the end of the season, that was the worst. It was always the stinkiest situation. But at the end of the season in the fall, they spray out their tanks right there, all over the land, right next to us. So on our side, we had abundant green lush light. You walk on the other side of the fence, barren cracked dirt, like just dead. And um, so this was a constant thorn in my side, you might say, or truly now it's the greatest gift because they motivated me. They were my best teachers because I got to be right there. And so for 20 years, I got to be right there. <laughs> and, um, and it's really what motivated the organic parks movement, you know, me being one piece of a lot of people's effort, including the mayor, Michael Rendon, including incredible moms, Joe McGordy and a huge amount of our community supporting that movement. But that, you know, that's a long journey that we'll talk a little bit about. But what's so exciting is that four years ago, they put their land up for sale and we were able to buy it <laughs> by a miracle of my mom, my grandmother, my father, people in the spirit world that uh, my, my mom's mom, my grandma had passed away, but her house was still in New Mexico, and the day it sold to the renters that had been there and been wanting to buy it, this opened, and we were able to just transfer on the deposit. So my mom officially owns the other two acres, but now we act as one, one four acre land. And so we had to get busy because it, it was sold as is, and that's a very toxic site that we got to work with. So we called in the mushrooms, <laughs> the mycelium, all these microorganisms and all this compost tea, and we just started the remediation journey. And I did soil samples right away. And within, you know, the first, well, very, like they were all really high in the beginning. And then every six months I would test again. And after our work and after a lot of inoculation, a lot of spraying compost tea, now the final test was, and this was a couple of years ago actually, was 0.0001% of the glyphosate. And so, it can get healed and we can help. You know, it's gonna heal eventually, but if we as humans add our input and really um, recharge, it's like we're calling in the army of life force. <laughs> and the microorganisms are incredible because they have this enzyme where they can break down petrochemicals into inert compounds. And so it's really exciting to know that we can help. So we had all these mushrooms, um, going into the soil and we get bags of oyster mushrooms and break it up in sawdust and wet it down and then just thick layer over the whole land. And uh, sometimes you have to be careful where you put your bags of sawdust because it grew oyster mushrooms on my axe. <laughs> <laughs> and then that stinky shed, what do we do with the stinky shed? Well, it's this building that had concrete floors and think about concrete, it's a porous you know, material that absorbed year after year spillage. And so what, I just happened to have a friend who dropped off buckets and buckets and buckets of clay. And that's what we used. We did like a facial mask where it drew up. <laughs> so we'd have these slip and slide mud parties with our, <laughs> and we would you know, get the mud going everywhere and then we let it dry and it just sucked out the herbicides from the concrete and then we'd scrape it off and do it again. And after that, 
it wasn't stinky anymore. The clay was stinky. And I actually had to dispose of the clay and I didn't, didn't know what to do. So dilution is the solution. It's like we can all handle a little bit. So I kind of went down back county roads and just a little sprinkle here and there to you know let it break down in a in a way where it wasn't so concentrated anywhere. So then we did a big remediation project on the space. We used clay paints. We, uh, you know, we, we had sprayed all the walls with compost tea and effective microorganisms and cleared out anything that had any residue, put in some bamboo floors. And now it's this amazing space that's a community kitchen and a guest space. And there's kids in abundance and feasts <laughs> that are happening there. And so that's, and then we have this amazing mural. We have the 13 wild bees painted on the, the east side. There's Maya painting this incredible sunflower. <laughs> so now we call the Stinky Shed. We don't use that name except in past tense. Now it's the Sun Center. <laughs> and so again, this is just an amazing example of how we can be positive influences on a kind of a tough situation. So, and then what's beautiful is in the garden after we inoculated it with so many mushrooms, and then we started growing a market garden. And it's this will be our third year growing the market garden, but it's just full of abundance. And there's so much life force now that we're getting to, to play with. And we have a farm stand in the summer times. And um, so that's the little journey of kind of walking something that needed a lot of attention into a place that we're in a present moment. And actually, I just want to introduce who is here that lives on the farm or stays on the farm often, or comes and visits the farm. <laughs> anyway, there's a lot of really good energy, incredible people that are contributing to its next level of how can we be a positive influence, not only for the land, but our neighbors and our bigger community through our art and our play and our you know vision and our work. So in this process, we're calling on the help of our weeds because they're incredible, hardworking remediators of planet Earth. Because each of these, there's a dandelion, there's a mallow, and there's a plantain. <laughs> and they do clean up the earth. They have these deep tap roots that pull up the minerals into their leaves. Then the leaves compost and rebuild topsoil. And then in the meantime, of course, their flowers are incredible for the pollinators. And you know, they're, they're breaking things down. And so we call in that as part of our teamwork for our Be Happy Lands project. So when we, when we say we have a crew is coming to show up, we are including all the thistles that live on the land <laughs> and all the dandelions or whoever it is, or the oxide daisies or the toad flax, you know, some of these are, or hound's tongue. These are some of the, the plants that certain places um, don't want them there. And part of it is that it's, you know, it's in the legality still. And that'll change. But at the moment, you know, there are these plants that are on the noxious weed lists that have been um, put out there in law. So it's tricky because we might see its benefit, but the law doesn't see the benefit yet. So there's this bridge that we're still doing. So when we come to a place and be happy lands, you know, we're organic land stewards. And so we show up and our intention is to increase the soil fertility and support the stability of the ecosystem and we add diversity. And obviously we also are essential to protecting the pollinators. So those are our four main goals. And, and then how we do that, you know, we're continually evolving our practices, but we're working with, this is an electro lake. This is a endangered leopard frog that lives, and these are sensitive creatures like the bees. They have very thin skins. And so um, electrolyte used to spray, well, we'll talk about, they unfortunately went back to spraying. Sometimes that happens, um, but they didn't, they were spraying a lot and then they hired us for many years. And it was just fantastic because when we see this little guy, it just felt so good to know that there was not gonna be these chemicals going into its home. And you know, the bees, all the insect pollinators are so susceptible to these, these exposures as Mandy spoke about. And so back in 2008, you know, we were working with the city. We got to start organic parks in our place. Because in my mind, 
yeah, I didn't want these chemicals in my backyard, but I didn't want them in anyone's backyard. So we have to make them obsolete. We have to make that so that humans don't think of that as an option anymore because we know too much. We're too smart that we would ever do that because we're not just thinking this way, we're realizing we have to think this way, way bigger. So Brookside Park was the gifted experimental park and the city gave it that, gave us that. And Turtle Lake Refuge offered to volunteer our efforts to put compost tea on it and weed, have weed parties. <laughs> and that was successful. And there's a big journey in the process of the organic parts movement, which some people who've been in this community might know a little bit about. But eight years later, Brookside is still organic and looking gorgeous. And they've hired Be Happy Lands to manage it now. And now there's also about nine other great organic parks in town. So I'll just go through the list, but this is Schneider Park and Riverfront and Organic Iris Park. And there's Needham, we manage Needham also. And Folsom is organic. And unfortunate, oh yeah, and there's Park Elementary School, which is wonderful. And then Riverview used to be, but then within the first year they decided, oh, this can't work, and they took it out. And so then this was a really tragic picture because they had just sprayed and your kids are already playing on it. And you know, so there's just this blind spot that we have of it. It's gotta be perfect, but we don't care that it's <laughs> that we toxic to our most precious beloved children, you know, and the bees. So the kids have something to say about this. <laughs> and then the journey, you know, there was just sometimes when we wanna make change, there's a lot of ways to make change, but sometimes we get kicked back because it's really uncomfortable for systems to make a big change. And we got a lot of kickback in the beginning because we asked for the first parks and then a second park and the city said, okay, but two, that's it. And two wasn't good enough. So we wrote a city ordinance. We had a great lawyer friend and we planned it so that right when marijuana was going on the ballot, we put our <laughs> organic weed, <laughs> you know, organic carbs on the ballot. And all the weed people were coming out to vote yes. <laughs> Everyone knew it was going to pass. <laughs> but unfortunately, the city just, it was big, a big, um, big drama. There was even a newspaper article about my neighbor and I, the dandelion debate on the front page of the newspaper and three hour council meetings. Anyway, eventually the, the mayor at the time and the counselors and the parks and rec director asked that we take it off the ballot because they knew it was going to pass. And there was this moment of, oh no, what should we do? Should we take a step back? Should we just push forward? Well, we chose to stay, take it off the ballot because we realized we have to do this together. And so even though we could push, we, it would get overturned and it would be harder. So we took a step back and then we had rewrote, because we wrote our ordinance really strict. All the parks had to be organic overnight. <laughs> that included their golf course. <laughs> it was a big ask. So we took a step back, we took it off, and then together we wrote an organic lands resolution. And then a third of the parks got passed the next year. So it's just a journey of dancing with a system and being a little pushy, but not over. Or sometimes you got to be over pushy. <laughs> you got to do what you got to do. Anyway, so the journey continues, but um, what's exciting is that it's getting so much easier. Uh, last, just this fall or this, um, yeah, maybe this winter, we went to the, the Parks and Rec Department and we asked, hey, we want to manage, we want the, the entire river trail to be organic. The entire Animus River Trail, which is 13 miles. And they said, okay. <laughs> and so they hired Be Happy Lands to do that now. So this will be our first year, making sure that all those great fruit trees, there's hawthorn and choke cherry and all these beautiful fruit trees, plums, are not sprayed along the river path bikeway. So that's exciting. And then the Dandelion Festival, which is this Saturday, is one of the, you know, we started that park to gain momentum for organic land stewardship. Like we, we want our community to get on board. So we, um, it's a super fun event. If you haven't come, gone, you should come, but we have a maypole and lots of vendors and incredible music. And um, we have some educational opportunities. Um, John's gonna be offering a sauerkraut making workshop. <laughs> and there's, um, our mascot, the dandelion, 
who gets a new paint job every year. And you know, as, as we know, the entire part of the dandelion is edible. And so we're gonna be offering dandelion pesto and dandelion lemonade. There'll be dandelion beer. We harvested 20 pounds of dandelions and thistles and gave it to Carver's Brewery. And they made this amazing beer for the event. And um, you know, there's the root makes great tea and the greens are delicious juice. So there's a fun educational and social part of the dandelion festival that will be happening this Saturday. And then actually Friday night, I'll mention this again, but we have a guest speaker who's going to be providing um, this amazing woman, Jacqueline uh, Freeman. She wrote a book called The Song of Increase, and it's about our relationship to bees and pollinators in a really biodynamic and pretty intimate way. But she'll be the guest speaker, and there's a wild food dinner that we're making on Friday night before the festival. Her name is Jacqueline Freeman. And she's from Washington, state of Washington. So she's sending us a slideshow presentation and then she'll be on Zoom for question and answer. So. The Dandelion Festival is created by us, yeah. by Turtle Lake Refuge. We've always been the, the momentum. There's been a lot of incredible forces that have made it happen, but yeah, we host it. Yeah. So then returning to Be Happy Lands, um, we have, you know, we have a, a lot of our practices, but basically we're, like I said, creating the stability and that we work with um, adding fungal influences, mycelium, the fungal soups, and, and then fertility, which would be the compost teas, and then diversity, we add seeds, and then any ways that we can, you know, protect forage for the insect population. So we don't want to just get rid of or eradicate a plant. That's not our purpose. We do want to create balance. And so that is how we work with it. So we're not trying to get rid of everybody, but we, we work with that bridge where we're showing value and trying to appease these different places. And so the, the scope of our work, we have been working in the valley floor of Telluride for the last seven or eight years, working on that whole 560 acres. And then Mancus, we do Cottonwood Park in Mancus. And then Electra Lake, we many years we've been doing their 600 acres, but then just last year they shifted, unfortunately, back. That happens. We have to let go and keep keep trusting. But and then the town of Durango and town of Ooper has hired us for all their open space. We do the entire town of Soft Pit. Soft Pit's not very big, <laughs> kind of easy. Um, and then Carbondale, it's new this year. We're going up to Carbondale. It's actually kind of exciting. They, um, they were, they are a pretty no spray town. They're actually our inspiration for the Dandelion Festival. Mm -hmm. So they started in the '90s doing their dandelion. They made the dandelion Carbondale's, you know, town flower. And then this year, you know, it's tough when you get new council members and maybe they're not as oriented or grounded in a place and they come with different ideas, but they felt panicked. And so they decided they passed, okay, we're going to spray our nature preserve dog park <laughs> for the first time ever with milestone and omnisite or something like that. And both uh, amino pyrolids, which are systemic herbicides that are long lasting in the soil, a terrible idea. So that got everybody stirred up in the town and there's been newspapers and um, radio interviews and ultimately they decided to hire Be Happy Lands and they're putting off spraying. So that's exciting. And they're gonna, we're going up there next um, the weekend after Dandelion to train their whole Parks and Rec staff. So that's really exciting. And it just feels like there's momentum going in this great direction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I appreciate the Dandelions and Carpenter a lot. <laughs> And then here's, you know, Electra Lake, and like that's eight acres of solid Canada thistle. <laughs> so, and, but what's interesting is this, it was um, sprayed consistently for years and years and years, and then they stopped spraying for two years. And then of course the, the land says, well, we got to remediate ourselves. Well, we use our wild weeds that are really good in disturbed soil, the pioneer species that come in and, and help remediate to do the work. This is us spraying compost tea, just so you know. <laughs> yeah. 
But here's a before and after of electrolytes. So this is in September of 2016. And then two years later, we have it's both in September. And there's a lot of factors, you know, um, rain has a factor and there's a lot of things. But what's fun is that our work does have a noticeable difference in this in this level of balance too. Yeah. Katrina, can you help me understand at what point would it move to be organic? Like what would qualify it? Like when you strip the chemicals and yeah. at what point does it turn to organic? If you were going to eat something from the land, I wait three years. But if you're going to be actively adding compost tea and microorganisms and fungal influences, then it could happen sooner. Okay. Like two, you know, or yeah. maybe even one. But yeah. But as far as, yeah, if you don't know, I would say wait three years. Okay. Yeah. And but unfortunately, like glyphosate can stay in the soil for seven years. So then, so it has a longer life. So. Sort of depends, <laughs> but use your intuition if you have, you know, a sense that you can. That's partly what we're doing is just like we communicate and we listen to each other and respond. Everything's communicating, and it's really fun to to open up our attention to all the ways that nature and all the beings in nature are communicating. And so we just start bringing our language wider, and then you, you can ask the land, you can feel, yeah. and get that kind of information. So here's Telluride, and we we work on not be, when I say 560 acres, that's the entirety of the valley floor, and we work in these zones. So we're, it's kind of these hot spots of, of where, and for them, they didn't like the oxide daisy, and um, and some people say it's a pollinator desert. I've heard that before, and when I sit with an oxide daisy, I think I like one year I just sat like, are you sure about this? They were about. 10 or to 20 insects that visited within five minutes, mm -hmm. including bees and all kinds of creatures. So I'm not sure about that. <laughs> and I think what there's this place of how do we get okay with change? Because that's the situation is that things are changing. And you're right, it didn't used to be here. And guess who else didn't used to be here? <laughs> all of us. And so if there's just has to be this next level of tolerance for change and diversity. And the native species, and when I say native, you know, there's these ranges of time because plants move just like animals, but they move slower, but they move with their seeds. And they're just like these plants are on every continent. They live on planet Earth. There's no place that's not their home. And so is it for us to think that that is, it's just a funny thinking. It's kind of a, a yeah, separateness thinking. So how do we get okay with an oxide daisy existing when it didn't used to be there? Well, if you don't worry about it, you can go have fun. <laughs> take fruit and take a nap. I mean, there's so many other things to do because nature's always gonna win, yeah. but we can fight. And then, uh, yeah. <laughs> so even though we go there and we work with it, um, anyway, there's that fine, there's that acceptance of seeing its value, changing our lens, that maybe it isn't a problem. Maybe every, all the insect population is actually adapting to this next species. And with the, with the native plants that need more fertile soil and more water, as our climate is changing, that's harder for them to survive, especially as humans, when we're such good disturbers of soil, we're changing the native habitat just by our existence. And so then we have to be okay with the changes that come with that too. So here's some of our practices is that we do collect some of the seed heads just because we want to include more diversity. So if there's one that's really prevalent, we might take some of that out of the system. And sometimes we'll bag them and sometimes we burn them or try to compost them. But some of the soil amendments that we use are yeah, the compost tea, the fungal soup, and I'll talk a little bit about that. We create a homeodynamic ash remedy and we yeah, use effective microorganisms and biochar. And so here's a compost tea recipe that's just real simple. And it's just, you know, your finished compost, some worm castings. We're feeding bacteria with, with the compost tea. So it's molasses and a little kelp seaweed for their mineral, and then non chlorinated water. And then we aerate it, you know, 24 to 36, 48 hours. And it's ready. And what it's doing is it's 
taking the microorganisms that are naturally in the compost or in the, we'll just say, the worm castings, and they were giving them really a lot of yummy food, molasses. They never probably had that <laughs> dose of like, whoa, all the sugar. <laughs> and so they multiply like crazy. And then you have this life force mass of all these bacteria that are thriving. And then you inoculate them into an area and then they go about their, their way and make home. And I, ideally build more microorganisms in a soil that's been disturbed or challenged. And so there's sometimes with making compost tea, we use a t-shirt or like as our tea bag. Sometimes we just throw compost right in and stir it up. But if we're putting it in sprayers, we can't, we want to sift out the particles. And this was actually us putting compost tea in 2008 at Brookside Park. And it was a big deal. They had, you know, camera people out there. And we were in the snow down schneer. Right? <laughs> Molasses thing. <laughs> there was good reason because the mayor at the time did not like us. <laughs> but that's okay. His life keeps going and um, <laughs> people change. See, and, and so here we are spraying compost tea. And then there's fungal soup. And fungal soup is really going up. Like if you're in a valley, which a lot of times we're working in valleys because that's where humans are disturbing or building or make trails. So we want to bring some of the mycelium influence that might be in a more forested area, a little higher elevation. So we'll go and get a scoop of that and then bring it down. And just like we live at 7,000 feet, you know, if you go to sea level, you can run farther and faster, but it's the opposite. If you come from sea level and you try to walk upstairs at 7,000 feet, it's, you know, so when we bring something from a higher elevation and we bring it down, it's gonna thrive a little more. And so we bring this, these, this uh, mycelium at the base of these trees, and then we add water, and it's, the water's a way to just distribute it across the valley floor. So that's, again, how we're inoculating the fungal activity into the, a place. And you know, when you see mushrooms, it's such a good sign because you know there's stability there. Like the fungal, the bacteria can handle more disturbance, but with fungal, like, like the mycelium, they thrive in places that are really uh, rich in um, carbon, broken down carbon sources, like their food. Trina, how did that become a circle? Like a fairy ring? Yeah. So it's Amanita mushrooms, and they sometimes just grow in these beautiful fairies. I don't know. How do we? <laughs> Maybe because they're a circle, generally mushrooms. And they spread their spores. Um, and so maybe their spores go out in a circle. <laughs> And so the homeodynamic ash remedy comes from, I'm, I'm trying to source its roots, but it's European, Rolf Steiner. Rolf Steiner is, I feel like, aligned with it. I haven't actually read his work. So it's, um, I sort of got a little thread of this in a book that my friend sent me a long time ago. And it just sort of, I think sometimes that's how you, you create things as you, you take, you know, a piece and then you add and you, and you listen and you keep going. But it's also rooted in homeo, homeo, homeopathy. <laughs> <laughs> Different words. So homeopathy and biodynamic. And this is a way of, and it's again, it was used in Europe as a way of dealing with pests. How do you deal with pests? Well, one way is you burn them into an ash and then you dilute that in a very potent homeopathic way to restructure the water around the communication of creating a boundary, like kind of warding off, like no, thank you, but not here. And so anyway, we do that with the plants with them using like their seeds and their roots. So we'll take a thistle and gather the seeds and the roots and then create this, this remedy. And then apply that, you can dilute it in water. And so a little bit can go a long way because it's very potent. And the more you dilute it, the more potent it gets. And as, as you're structuring the water, it's quite an interesting concept to try to think about. But it is something that just adds another dimension of balancing an ecosystem. When something's really thriving, then we encourage more diversity and also create a bit of a boundary to it. And then a, a, and a big part of the Be Happy Lands work is our um, education about the edible medicinal diets. And that's the fun part is that 
You know, whether when we go to a place, we might be harvesting the dandelions and then we end up washing the roots and drying the greens and utilize it. If it's clean, then we'll utilize it in our cafe <laughs> and if, in our recipes. And so even the thistles, um, whether it's Canada thistle or musk thistle, the whole part of the plant is edible. And so you can use the little purple flowers as chewing gum. There's so much nectar in the purple flowers. And the greens are so alkalinizing and offer so much minerals and enzymes and chlorophyll for the body. So they make a fabulous thistle lemonade. <laughs> and once you taste this, once you drink it, you, your body is almost like it awakens because sometimes we haven't been fed some of these wild foods much of our growing up. So we don't even know. But once the body starts to recognize the amount of density of nutrition, it's an exciting thing to experience firsthand. When you can hear about it, but when you feel it, it's kind of an awakening to a certain way. So a simple green juice is just like a cup of thistle greens, a lemon, an apple, water. Blend it all together and strain it out. You can strain out all the prickles. <laughs> and then that's just an amazing morning drink. And it's a good practice because it, just like we brush our teeth each night and each morning, it's one of those self-care hygiene things. When you drink a green juice, that chlorophyll binds to toxins that we've accumulated throughout the day or in the night, and it gets rid of them. So it's, it's like we're always in this balance of how much am I taking in in this 21st century of exposure to every kind of chemical in the world? <laughs> And how much am I getting rid of so I can stay in balance and health? So that's what the greens do. These wild greens are really supportive in keeping us in balance. And then the thistle seeds, you can gather those and make a delicious milk, blending up these wild seeds with sunflower seeds and almonds, as well as a little honey and vanilla. And same thing, blend it out and strain it out and you have this great milk. And it's highly nutritious. There's a lot of carbohydrates in these seeds. And then the roots, and um, we're really blessed today because I made some thistle root chai. So you guys all get to have a little thistle. <laughs> but uh, we sell this at the farmer's market. But the thistle roots regenerate liver cells. And we need liver cells in this day and age because we're exposed to so many toxins. And the liver gets it out of our system. And that's what the thistle helps us do is keep that balance of health. And so I'm going to close with a this little quote, which was in my bathroom growing up. And I think that's probably what directed my life's path because I went there multiple times a day <laughs> and studied this question. And so, yeah, what is a weed? Well, it's a weed to some, but it's wealth to others. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, that's the end of our talk. <laughs> And actually, I'll leave you with one more slide if you're interested in coming to this presentation on bees. Um, that's the information. Mm -hmm. You can make reservations online. So anyway, I'd love to open it to questions if you have anything. And if anyone is available for volunteering and helping pour chai tea, I have cups and the chai's in the back and there's ice. Um, so I'm asking a couple, two or three volunteers. Yes, please. Yeah. That's great. Do they post on the property so that people can move the new? Unfortunately, on the ballpark, they didn't. And that's where the kids are playing. And so that was real tragic. Usually they try to, you know, do that. But also they can take it off within maybe 24 hours. I think, you know, according to the regulation, sure they can do that. It's tough. Yeah. 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 I was looking at all your organic parts. Um, are you doing anything for uh, reseeding? It yeah. Don't like dirt it, but... We sure are. Yeah. The city gives us their soccer mix. And so as we're digging the dandelions out, or the plantain out, and we sprinkle it. That's funny. I didn't put that in the slide. Sorry. Thanks. But yeah. We put seeds. And we mix a third seeds with a third compost and a third fine mulch like sawdust or kind of a. And they're, they're supplying the seeds. They provide the seeds. And then when we're in wild lands, we get it from Southwest Seed. And there's a lot of different mixes that we use at different elevations. And so, um, yeah. yeah and actually, I wanted to mention that we, just last year, we started putting biochar in some of our soil amendments. 
And I wanted to introduce Sam Bennett. Uh, if you want to stand up and just maybe say a little bit about biochar or just let us, if you, anything you'd like to share. <laughs> sure. Yeah, <laughs> we can put this one. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I have uh, been working with Katrina for a year now. Um, I was on a lot of these projects that she mentioned, and I have been into biochar and learning about it and learning about how to use it in the environment and to tackle some of the problems that you've been mentioning. Um, so I've been learning from a couple books out there. I don't know if you guys are looking for anything for your reading list, but mm -hmm. This is um, by one of the industry leaders and biochar. And I, I don't know, I took plant science classes just a couple of years ago and wasn't covered at all. Um, I had to do all my own research, learn about it. Um, so yeah, I learned a lot and it's really good for the environment. It's really good for the fungals, helps multiply the microbes even more. It breaks down the pesticides and the herbicides and the harsh chemicals. Um, and it's like a, a basically a battery for your soil. And yeah, um, we're discovering how to use it out in the community. And I'm um, actually getting uh, going to a workshop this summer uh, put on by the International Biochar Initiative. I'll be learning to become some of the industry leaders. Uh, excited for that. And we'll be bringing that knowledge back here to our community and our parks and our farms and gardens. So yeah, if anybody has any questions or wants to see it, it's right here. Um, I recycle it uh, or upcycle it uh, in the backyard. Uh, just in some burn barrels that have been uh, just put them at a 45 degree angle and no hole in them. It'll have a specific type of fire that uh, uh, low oxygen and that makes it recalcitrant carbon. And then that makes it like Basically, it's charcoal, but it's charcoal that's been harvested and doesn't have any ash on it, anything like that. So once you break it down, you crush it and process it. Um, it's extremely high surface area. Um, we're talking like just one little pebble in there has like 9,000 square feet of surface area. Wow. And so that does a lot for the environment, for the soil. And so charcoal used like that is basically was at the heart of the most fertile parts of the Amazon. So once you put it in the soil, it stays there permanently. It doesn't degrade. It keeps helping the soil fertility and all the microbiome and everything constantly go up. And so that's what we're going to be focusing on this year and working on our practices, some of the projects. Is that kind of like what nature does when there's constant natural burns that take place in yeah. forests and stuff? And that that would be very similar um new generation within nature's natural system. Yeah, so making biochar uh, like I do is basically just bottling out everything a wildfire and not sacrificing the forest on yeah. structure of the other. Um and then after you make it yourself and you have it, um, you get to directly charge it with your own fertile or um, compost, peas, microbes, fungals, uh, nutrients, if you ever, whatever you need, will attach straight into the biochar. Basically, that's stapling your nitrogen and your carbon together, which makes it available uh, for plants right away, but it also is very lucrative nitrogen because when there's chemicals from these sprays and herbicides and stuff, and the land is uh, Basically, the land has been polluted with chemicals, and then uh, the microplast that proliferates and takes off um, is like chemotropes, I think. Basically, chemicals that just live off of chemicals in non organic, organic form. And so that crowds out all the natural organic ones. So when you put in biochar, it just halts that, it absorbs and breaks down the heavy chemicals, just like the uh, fungal mycelium roots do for the petrochemicals. This locks them away and then also has space to it absorbs water, uh, microbes, which I don't know, it just has a bunch of stuff. So I'm learning more about it from, uh, I don't know, it's like the only class time I think 
out there right now. So I'm really excited. I know I have a lot of do yourself research for a couple of years, but now I'm going to actually learn from experts. And so, yeah, excited. Do you have a business name? Yeah, uh, <laughs> trying to start a company from everything I've learned and getting some new clients and working with Katrina. Uh, so, if you guys want to look me up or if you have any questions, uh, we have an Instagram. It's just called Gardens of Fire underscore everything. Garden. Gardens of Fire. Gardens of Fire. And if you have any information, you can. Put some out there, or you can come in. Yeah, I have. Um, I was working with a farm in Bayfield, uh, All Seasons Farm. Uh, he, he was looking into biocharge like Katrina was, and he actually has a firewood operation where he makes he gets a lot of wood uh, slash byproduct that is just uh, he's got to pay to get rid of. It's just a waste to him. But he also has a farm, and so he was like, "Oh, if you're you know want some to get into biocharge, I have a bunch of product." So I've been working with him to clear his wood yard, and now I have so much carbon material <laughs> that I've cycled. So if you guys uh, want to learn about how to make it, I think I'm going to host some weekend workshops. If you want to just see how to set up yourself and try to make some of your own, it works well with any farm or gardening operation or any hobby passion level, I guess. Um, but yeah, just look me up. Uh, if you have any questions, you can. Talk to Katrina and give my number or reach out to me to Instagram. Uh, we don't have a website yet, but we'll try to put it together. Yeah. Nobody will have a problem. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you, Bruce. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm Bruce. Uh, I'm Bruce. Yeah, I'll pass it back around. This is um, it's called okay. Burn. Um, they changed the title, but it was How to Cool the World with uh, Fire. And they updated the title to it is. But, um, it's written by Kathleen Draper, who's like the director of the U.S. Center for Carbon Intelligence, and then there's going to be a bunch of professors from Cornell, brought to us in technology. So yeah, all this stuff is like just coming out uh, at the academic level. Yeah, too much to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And while while Sam is up here, I actually just wanted everyone who's worked for Be Happy or will be working for Be Happy this season, I'd love to have you just stand up and. Have us all give you a round of applause for the <laughs> And we can keep um, taking questions, but I'd love to have somebody pass out the chai to people. Yes. Well, I'm curious. Uh, we see these jet rails flying over us yeah. every single day. And I know from what I read that they're dropping chemicals, whatever. So how do you counteract this with soil and humans? Great question. We need a big umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> it's about a big sick. Yeah. And they think they have sinus issues, yeah. whatever. And yeah. it's coming from all. You know, these are, there's like that. The big EMFs of all the satellites going up in the last few years, we've had tens of thousands. You know, it's like different, it's changing things in a pretty fast way. Yeah. And then these insecticides that are systemic, that are being, that are, they're in the seed and then every part of the pollen and nectar and everything. There's some big problems out there. Maybe those aren't the only three, but those are big. And how do we, how do we work with something so big? There's ways. I, Here's a toast to the solution to those big problems. I trust that we can come up with some ways, and it's our creativity and our deep listening and asking those questions and noticing, but not getting overwhelmed because it can feel so overwhelming. But let's stay safe in our own, you know, even the mantra I'm healthy, happy, <laughs> grateful, and connected. We don't realize what's coming down. That right. So we have to be aware, but not have it overwhelm us. So there's this balance. And keep opening to the solutions because we're creative enough that I trust we're going to find them yep. together and it may become obsolete. Yeah. Uh, so I have been learning more about weeds and so I'm fascinated by this things like lamp quarters and mallow and plantain and you know the other weeds that go around my garden and, and my place. And, and then I, I've been realizing that. You know, these aren't really weeds, they are beneficial plants right. in so many ways. Right. But then I started giving certain plants weeds with a capital W, mm -hmm. like Russian olive, like 
uh, rushing through single or tumbleweed. <clears throat> now these seem really talk about overwhelming. Can you speak on that? Of course you can. Yeah. Appreciate you saying that because that's real. Like the emotions that we feel when we're overwhelmed by something and it feels like a real problem. And um, and so I just honor that experience. And it's good to know that, yeah, I'm human and I wish I was could be friends with everybody into this moment. I actually don't like you. <laughs> That's okay. But then don't stop there because um, what's exciting about Russian olives, it's one of the best nectar sources for the honeybees. And Russian olive honey is one of the most elixir foods on the planet. Like So these Russian olives, yes, they didn't used to be here, but they are here now and they're actually serving the insect population. So there's that place, can we accept change? And um, so, and I actually love to eat the Russian olives. They're an edible fruit that is like a little mesquite pod. It's like a slightly, slightly sweet, big seed, but you can eat the out skin of the seed and it's really delicious. So they may not be a villain after all. <laughs> and then with Russian thistle, it's delicious when it's a tiny little green sprout. It's so tender and delicate and you can gobble it up and maybe that's the time to eat it a lot. So it doesn't grow into the big you know, thing that rolls around. But when they get to that big, what I learned from the Navajo, I was in Shiprock one time and I was teaching a plant walk class, but all these beautiful Navajo people came and taught me so many things, but they took the tumbleweed and they ground it into flour and used it to make bread. So it's good to remember everything has a resource, especially if the stores are not available for us at some point. If you know we don't ever need to think that way, but it's not a bad idea to know what we can eat right here because it's probably way better than anything in the store. Oh, yeah. Thank, thank you, you so for much. your question. And also thank you for this delicious. <laughs> and you can feel those livers go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Speak more to uh, maybe we just tell me what you were saying how the sky and the leaves are shot a lot. Yeah. And what does that mean exactly? And what are this like bad kids with the leaves? Right. Yeah, you know, the most wanted. Yeah. Um, you know, every every country on the planet has it. Even Scotland, you know, and their national flat their national flowers are thistle, but they still spray thistles. <laughs> And even Antarctica, where there's only four flowering species, they're already thinking weeds. Every newcomer is a weed. So it's it's a thinking that, but in Colorado, in Laplata County, we have our weed list that's kind of mandated eradication to the point of law, where unfortunately the county can see, oh, you've got those weeds. If you don't do something about it, we're going to come in and spray and give you the bill. Like it's, it's set up like that in places. So there's different plants that are that have just done well, <laughs> really. You know, they, they have kind of adapted to this climate. And it's because they're actually needed. You know, if we think about nature, nature puts those kinds of plants right up front to regenerate. Mm -hmm. But they will succeed. They will, like, make way to the next succession species. So they're only there for a period of time. And then they're actually making the ground for the next plant that needs more fertility, and then they make it for the next plant that needs more fertility. So it's it's going always in the right direction. We just have to be more patient. Yeah, so like thistles are a pioneer species, right? right. We usually deal with compacted soil that yeah. needs nutrients. So that's right. Yeah. yeah. So. And so, and we can, as you, you know, and that's what we do with the Be Happy Crew is we help it go a little faster. Like we add our influence to create, create more fertility so that other plants can come in. Yeah. Uh, good question. You can have seconds on the thistle chat. There's plenty. After all these things, what was the mind that they're not? It's so strange that they're not really. Yeah. It's so. running off and telling me all these things. Like, you lost so much of your yeah, but it's still amazing that the heart is still Like you mentioned about the growth of the you know, that's definitely everybody's brainwashed. They're trying to 
But I like how you said it in the beginning, and how Mandy said it too. It's it's common sense. Like it be let's treat it like this is this is the come on guys. We all know this. Like let's get to that level on a bigger scale where I mean it's like food. Yeah. I can treat all the things I do not get access to this food and awesome. Like that's that's why like literally the past couple of seasons we had a cell search and we had to do that. And it's clear how much longer you are than you get for the past ten years ago. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and they're going to be the future. Yeah, thank you. I do have a little plug. Um, <clears throat> so Cynthia and I are co-founding a company called Get Cup Food. Real stands for regenerative, ethical, accessible, and local. And our goal is to verify restaurants and markets that are actually sourcing local regenerative food. Yeah, and then putting it on the app. So wherever you go, you can find nice. real food. It's, so it's getrealfood.com. Right now we just have a splash page up so you can enter your email and then we'll update you when we're ready to go. But that's, that's in the works right now. So important because <clears throat> When the more we research and the more we start to know what's happening to the conventional agriculture, it is absolutely 100% scary wrong way because, and I'll just say this briefly, but the conventional foods, and that's like, there's six main crops that globally are being, you know, and it's like monoculture, but they're using this neonicotinide insecticide that goes into the seed. And they think, oh, it's better because we don't have to spray Roundup. It's way worse because it's in the seed in every part of that plant, including the dew, the pollen, the nectar is toxic for years. It's in the soil then. And so these things are, it started in 2008 and it's gone rampant as becoming the most popular way of growing conventional foods. And that's, and so unfortunately, like every restaurant that is not using organic flour, that's where they're getting it. And we're supporting this, you know, desiccation of the insects population. And so it's just one of those things we have to take that step really fast, like shift it over right now and stop those practices. Those are, so thank you yeah. for letting us know which restaurants we can trust and we can go towards and be choosy. Well, and it's not gonna be easy because it's, you know, like you were just talking about, there's so many restaurants that will say farm to table and they might have one thing during the summer that they put on their menu and then they can claim farm to table because it's not a regulated term. And so our goal is to get out there and, and verify, not just with the restaurant, but then go to the farmers and ranchers and, and actually confirm you're sourcing this way. What are your practices? And everyone's in transition. It's like not every regenerative farmer is like doing the most regenerative things, but they're healing land and they have the right heart space for what they're doing. And they're creating that community and that health and that vitality. So that's what we're working towards. And we also want to have a, a side of this as well that's helping to uh, you know, get farmers and ranchers to have land access because that's another massive issue. You know, our average age of our farmers right now is like 59.8 or something. They have a huge land succession that's getting ready to happen, and yet no one can afford land. So how can we get land in the hands of people who want to do the right thing? Um, and it's not that industrial farmers want to farm. It's just that system, right? And they're stuck. So we need to transition conventional industrial farms. We need to get these new comers, you know, that are wanting to do these cool things. And there's a lot of cool stuff happening. So, yeah. So we also are going to have that fun side where it's like we can get money, you know, going towards land access, but also for lower income populations to get this kind of healthy food, non-toxic food, so that we stop having those massive disparities in society because that was all created by us and we can change that. So, anyways. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just you can all be like activists and make a change. Um, do you have like a fun little elevator pitch, you know, like something <laughs> high-friendly fans 
maybe not understand or like yeah to, you know big bullet point of like fun little catchphrases to get people for it. Yeah, so what would be an example? Like you would be talking to I mean, like I know, someone whose dad is a little rancher. Yeah. And they spray their thistles. They spray their thistles. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, how I try it. <laughs> they usually yeah, get it inside. That's the teacher, and then the teaching happens from the inside out. <laughs> that is a good thing. That's a good question. Um, so I just know you have done that. Austin, the head of the Focus, ran him. And for, for six months, I was like, what is this thing like that? It happened. And I, so I appreciate it. Really, so it's like, if you have an opportunity, can I spend some time? Yeah. And it's just like the mind of the questions. The one thing that helped when I was talking to the Parks and Rec director in Parkdale, because he was all set to stay, and it's like, okay, I have this, I have this like make or break moment with him on the phone, a short conversation. And I said, oh, I would never put him aside because I know way too much about what they do. Right. <laughs> and then I realized, well, actually I do. And it was tough by just saying something, to him. Um, but it worked. It was like, oh, well, because like, he doesn't know and he's scared and he's backed into a corner. And he feels like, well, nothing's working, so this is our last resort solution. We don't want to do this, but we have to. And then it was like, we know way too much about that path, you know. And just like we spread BDT around, you know, we don't want to learn after the fact that everybody needs to be silent, silent spring. <laughs> yeah, that we're like, no, let's not go there. Let's not. Let's go slow, like a turtle. Let's listen and wait. And it's okay that we don't know. Thanks. <laughs> I don't know if you all know about biogeometry. Biogeometric signature. There's this guy, Abraham Cunningham, from Egypt, and he's kind of like the head of this foundation here. He has the base in Africa, or Africa, or North Carolina. And they started using this. I get, uh, this is like designed and likely in an agriculture, the fashion industry, like textiles. They used it for avoiding vaccinations of livestock. I mean, there are these men who are like classical values and they're just going to do this with lots of different industries. And so it's fascinating. And what is that we just, it's on the same premise of how you approach the human uh, traffic. Yeah. Um, so how do you think you're proud of that customer? How do you not that? And it was a clear reference in how it was used in Europe and how they were used to that. But the fact that here I'm hearing it from a second story. <laughs> yeah, creativity as humans, I think we can create big solutions. Solution there. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like the mycorrhizal fungi below the soil. We can do that with our connections as people. Yeah. And we can do crazy awesome things and co-create regeneration and yeah. all that fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate everyone who is doing your part, you know, asking the questions, noticing. Yep. Sharing, yeah. Yeah. I think it's been a rough thing to do it after yesterday when we went on our rocky trip. Uh, and we were picking the fresh asparagus on the river and eating it and like eating broccoli stuff. And a couple of my friends brought up to me and now I have questions that you might probably know. What about all the uh Minerals from mining that are so present in the river very heavily, like not many the banks, and then you can grab food along the banks. Is that an issue? So, yeah, there's lots of issues. Um, but burdock root is a great plant to eat that chelates to heavy metal toxins and gets it out of our system. So, yeah, we live in a mining <clears throat> area. So, we probably, and I, you know, when we drink creek water, I mean, we might be coming down from a mine, even if we try to be careful. Um, we're probably accumulating some heavy metals, all of us. And so, yeah, it's almost these preventative things. We do our best to be mindful, but we can't always. And so then add in things that are going to help. So burdock is good. Cilantro. What other things help take out heavy metals? <laughs> Seaweed. Milk that's like Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Thank you all so much for coming. <laughs> Of course, I'm going to have to do a talk to the audience.